Well, if you find this funny, we live in a hyper-connected world, and uh, my sincere gratitude to everyone in this room who is helping make that happen. So I'm not going to talk about broadband and 5G technologies today. Uh, you've heard enough of that in this uh, conference. What I'm going to talk about is how one of the biggest consumers of telecom think about connectivity and how connectivity is being used as a competitive advantage uh, and how uh, Uber, as one of the companies, is being a benefactor for all the great work uh, that you folks are doing uh, in this room. Uh, a little bit about me, I started building technology to consulting about technology, and I sold uh, tech and did tech partnerships for my last few gigs, and I'm on the boards uh, of some companies and based in Silicon Valley. All right, so I want to talk about uh, Uber uh, for a little while because that explains the extent of uh, connectivity challenges that we have and how, what does connectivity mean for a company like Uber, and how we're using connectivity as a competitive advantage. So we recently completed 10 billion trips early this year uh, around the world, and we're still growing 34% uh, year on year on our gross bookings. This is the amount we make before we give a cut to the drivers, uh, around 20% year on year net revenue growth, uh, considering uh, you know, more than $100 billion of uh, gross bookings were made on our platform. Uh, around 108% year-on-year growth on the Uber Eats side uh, is doubling every year. Uh, I guess uh, food is not as restrictive as uh, taxis around the world, so we're growing faster there. Uh, it's still an impressive 31% year-on-year net revenue growth uh, on that uh, product as well. We have around 93 million drivers on our platform. We actually, I need to update these numbers, recently crossed 100 million active uh, riders, and, uh, and we're still growing at 33% year on year. We have around 4.3 million drivers on our platform looking for work on a monthly basis. To put it in perspective, that's more people than People's Liberation of Army of China and US Department of Defense. These are people looking for work on our platform. We are in around 70 countries, 700 cities, we, are, we have around 22,000 employees. Uh, at the end of the year, we'll close around 30,000. Uh, around 50,000 BPO agents. These people are located in 25 different countries, take your fair queries uh, and, and uh, with our partners. We are in around 750 hubs. These are locations where, if you want to be an Uber driver, you can onboard yourself by going to these hubs. And we, we, are, we are doing half a million concurrent trips uh, at any given point in time, so the connectivity and the infrastructure need to support it. It'll be a million concurrent trips by end of the year. So every second, there's 200 trips happening around the world. And uh, so we need to have our connectivity and infrastructure supporting that as well. Some of the product lines that we have, UberX is your flagship a product that competes with taxis around the world. Pool, this is our CSR initiative, taking carbon off the road, uh, truly uh, having somebody uh, be in your car and share uh, a ride. We have Uber Select, these are for premium cars. Uh, Uber Black, you get a premium car with a professional driver. Excel for large family groups. We have SUV, you get a big car, premium car, professional driver for this uh, ride. We have Assist, uh, these are products designed for disabled uh, people. For example, in London, all the cabs are mandated to have a, a ramp, but a lot of them don't stop for disabled people because it's a hassle. So as a, a company, we prioritized a product where disabled people can hail a ride. Uh, we have Uber Pet, uh, if you have a pet and traveling with a pet, it's a challenge. So there are products designed for that. It's live in a lot of cities like Mexico City. We have Uber Lite, this, is, uh, this works in 2G uh, because connectivity, even 3G is not ubiquitous around the world. Uh, so this is an app specifically designed to work in 2G markets, live in India, Brazil, et cetera. Uber for Business, this is our uh, corporate uh, version. We sell into travel departments of companies. You don't have to, you can have a separate profile while expensing your rides and it gives some discounts for uh, travel departments who sign up. 
uh, Eats, this is our version um, of people delivering things. So Uber started off as people moving people. I had spare seat in my car, so I used to move my friend. That's people moving people. Now we figured out we have this network. People can also move things. So we started moving things like food. And then we said, OK, we can probably move bigger items uh, like freight. So in America, uh, freight is four times bigger than consumer transportation. Uh, this is the lifeline of many countries. If you bought anything from a retail store, it probably reached you through a freight carrier. And it's the, the industry still works very manually. Uh, phone calls, brokers, uh, middlemen. Uh, there's a huge opportunity to transform this, uh, and we have launched this in Europe recently as well. Uber Health, uh, one-fourth of U.S. healthcare appointments are canceled because patients don't have a way to get to, from, the hosp uh, from their homes to hospital. And that's a big problem because uh, you know, insurance companies lose a lot of money uh, because people are getting sick. So prevention is better than cure, so insurance companies actually pay hospitals to actually have patients take a ride. Uh, so it's a huge business that is HIPAA compliant uh, to uh, take patients to the hospital. We have autonomous vehicles. Uh, this would help create an era of uh, safety. Uh, driving is one of the biggest causes of death after some of the natural causes. So how do we make roads safer? Uh, I think we, uh, we, we, we are looking at an era where driving is going to be um, uh, obsolete as we know it in, in, in uh, coming years. We have uh, a company that we acquired, uh, which basically has scooters and bikes uh, that you can hail from a grid. Uh, we are in the city of uh, bikes. Uh, so now it's going digital. Uh, and to, be, to, to give an example of how this can help cities, uh, we, so I live in San Francisco. From downtown San Francisco to the train station, it takes around 23 minutes on an Uber X ride, but if I take one of these bikes, it gets me there in less than half uh, the time it takes for a car. And it, it is the answer to getting cities getting crowded. Uber Moto, so this is live in a lot of Asian and Latin American cities where it's really easy to get to a play, from place A to place B uh, using two wheelers. And four wheelers are not a great way to sometimes get to an appointment that you uh, uh, want to get on time. We have groceries. We not only move um, food, we uh, cook food, but also ingredients to cook that food. Uber Boat, this is live in uh, many, many places, including Croatia, Nigeria. It, 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 it's the same concept, but you can hail a, hail a boat. Uh, we have drones. Uh, so the concept of people moving people, people moving things, now has expanded to a world where Things can move people. So you have these bikes and scooters lying around cities. These are things that are connected that can move people. Now, we are also getting into an era where things can move things. Can, Uber, can these drones move Uber Eats packages? So we live in a connected world where the connectivity of these things are super important for us to actually drive revenues for our businesses. We have Uber Elevate. This is. Uh, uh, it's a, we call it EV tolls, uh, electric vertical takeoff and landing uh, 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 planes or uh, devices, uh, cars. And these are our answer to congestion in cities. So like how sk skyscrapers were built in t uh, many cities to uh, get more space in cities. So the, there's no place to grow except up. We also feel that at some point the cities will mandate that there's no no law, no they're not going to allow more cars or more vehicles. You have to have the three-dimensional space to actually move the people and things around. So this is what we're dealing with. Uh, and to help connectivity uh, for all these product lines, we need to really partner with the industry to make that happen. So I'll give you a picture of what connectivity and IoT means at Uber. Messaging. Uber is still very much uh, uh, reliant on messaging in terms of SMS, for example, because uh, that's the best way to reach our drivers, uh, especially when they're on the road. Uh, these uh, uh, people are not able to check their emails or uh, voice is too intrusive. So we rely heavily on SMS. Uh, and uh, we make or break this market. We're one of the biggest senders of SMS in the world. Um, both for drivers around the world, riders in countries where it's not too restrictive to send SMS. Uh, 
including one-time passwords. 95% uh, of the login attempts into Uber are fraudulent because people are trying to hack. Uh, and how do we have these mechanisms to um, authenticate uh, logins as well? So deep uh, tie-ups with telcos to actually make that happen. Uh, we also used to have uh, communication enabled between uh, SMS communication enabled riders and drivers, but at that time we used to expose phone numbers uh, for the between the riders and drivers, and that was a big security risk because in some countries, drivers used to get phone numbers of passengers, especially female passengers, to then harass them uh, later on. So how do we not? And and our competitors in a lot of markets are using this against Uber as a, uh, a, a and ha had a negative effect on the brand. So we then figured out, okay, we will anonymize these SMS being sent, and then there's billions of SMS being sent every month which meant we we're spending a lot of money on anonymizing these SMS communications. And then we had a product idea where let's make this uh, a communication in the app, which is cheap, 95% cheaper, but at the same time, we are able to communicate between them uh, to uh, have the driver pick up the rider on time. Voice, uh, we are one of the biggest consumers of voice as well. Uh, we, uh, one of the things that we do on the SMS side is we uh, we need that to have you log in when you download the app. But a lot of people used to sign up with landline numbers. Uh, as you know, SMS cannot be sent to a landline number. So we then figured out, okay, we need to have some text-to-speech conversion where we can send a voicemail to the rider so that they can still log in to Uber. Uh, as I mentioned, voice anonymization, uh, people, around one-third of the contact that happens at Uber ends up in a... Uh, one third of the trips end up in a contact, which means people are calling each other to find out uh, where they can be picked up. And we used to expose phone numbers of riders and drivers while this happened, and that was a big, huge safety risk. So then we worked with the industry to make sure that the voice, the phone numbers that you see when driver calls you is not a real phone number, it's an anonymized phone number. We, we call it number masking. And uh, which meant we are powering billions of minutes every year sorry, every month uh, in, um, in this and incurring these costs. But this is super important because how do we get the cost down in a market uh, where the safety is important, but uh, some of these uh, costs actually ended up being 20% of the trip cost, which was unsustainable in the long run as well. And then we, we decided that uh, we were gonna see if we have better ways to serve uh, the anonymized uh, calling needs, and we build our own VoIP functionality in our app to actually have these uh, riders and drivers, eaters and couriers communicate with each other, um, because that was all, and, and hence reduce these anonymization uh, PSTN costs by 90, 95%. We also uh, are operating in 70 plus countries, which means we want uh, riders uh, and drivers in those countries to call to Uber call centers to, uh, to, to, for any support uh, concerns. Uh, we used to give 800 numbers, 1-800 numbers, which were super expensive uh, when it comes to support. Then we went out to these 70 countries and sourced city by city, county by county, state by state in some cases, local phone numbers to help them support uh, our call centers, our 50,000 agents who receive these calls. We still have not opened up our phone lines to drivers because that just would break our bank. So we are working with a lot of telcos in, in the industry to see what are the more economical ways to open up uh, customer support uh, to the 100 million drivers. So imagine Facebook had a hotline uh, that would just break their uh, uh, bank on actually having the calls come in. We also support all the contact center technologies these um, uh, agents use uh, sitting in 25 different countries around the world. One of the big problems that we had was drivers were signing up to be Uber drivers, but they were not driving. Uh, around 30% uh, were signing up, but they were not driving because uh, for whatever reason. Uh, so we had a big call center team actually calling them up, asking them, hey, uh, it looks like you've signed up, but you're not driving. What, what happened? Can we help? Uh, now, we, of course, partnered with the industry to come up with some sort of automated calling solution that follows all regulations that can remind these drivers to actually drive for Uber. Uh, so again, partnering with the industry to make things like this happen in market by market. Uh, 
Uh, Uber does not have any desk phones, uh, so everyone has a soft phone. Uh, and again, driving the data uh, needs for um, the, um, uh, the market as well. Networks, so Uber has distinct networks. We call our production network prime network. This is the network that supports our rights, eats our core businesses. With data centers located in six different locations, pops around the world, and uh, transatlantic, trans-Pacific, uh, and uh, trans-Indian Ocean connectivity, and metro dark fiber, et cetera, supporting the connectivity in, uh, between different Uber uh, data centers. We have a corporate network connecting our 800 plus offices worldwide, and uh, which is a separate network and separate uh, backbone that uh, supports all inter-Uber communications. Most of our calls within the company happen via video communications. Uh, it's pretty uh, standard for us to have a meetings with our fellow employees around the world, and pretty clear uh, video content uh, traveling between continents. Hub network, these are locations where you can sign up to be Uber drivers. And uh, again, connected via a separate network that connects uh, all the locations that uh, you, you can be a driver, go to a location like this. It's like a version of an Apple store. You can, you know, in some locations you can rest for a while, have coffee, get internet, even get a massage in some, some of these locations. Autonomous car network. So this is a separate network that supports our auto autonomous cars. So there are 400 cars currently in um, San Francisco, Pittsburgh, and Toronto. Uh, just to give a perspective of the data, um, each car, when it goes around for six hours, it emits around two terabytes of data. So there is a mini data center compute stack in these cars. And just to put it in perspective, two terabytes of data on a 21-day on uh, work month for around 400 cars. That's the same amount of data the state of Hawaii consumes on a mobile broadband uh, every month. Uh, so you can imagine if this 300 cars become 30,000, uh, 3,000 cars, 30,000, even 300,000 cars, we're dealing with a huge uh, big data problem on what do you do with uh, the data being emitted from these self-driving uh, cars. We have a separate network connecting our 25 different locations, uh, global backbone, uh, mostly carrying voice uh, as a primary, uh, 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 primary data uh, component uh, for, for that network. We also do peering with uh, many uh, software providers, cloud companies, um, with telcos around the world so that uh, we, we don't have the data go through the internet. We also are working with companies in the industry to do something like bandwidth on demand. Uh, so the two biggest uh, days, especially in America, for Uber are uh, New Year's Eve. Uh, I guess people don't want to drink and drive. Uh, and uh, Halloween. Uh, I think people don't want to dress up and drive too. So uh, we, how do we, and the traffic uh, patterns for us are 3x of, uh, 3 to 4, 5x of what it is on a regular day. So how do we not pay for the bandwidth that we don't use on a regular basis? How do we do bandwidth on demand effectively in the industry as well? It's something that uh, we are actively working on. IoT network. So we have a lot of connected objects within Uber, uh, and we don't want those going on the public network. So we have private networks connecting uh, the gateways, connecting uh, these connected objects back into Uber as well. So all of these are separate, disparate networks for which we partner with the industry to make sure we have effective solutions. Uh, we also have wireless. We provide corporate cell phones for our employees, internet on the go for field workers. Uh, we sometimes launch offices faster than we can get internet connectivity in these offices in lots of parts of, uh, for example, Africa and Asia. Uh, it's some, we, so there, are, there used to be launch teams where we used to get approval today. The launch teams are in there in that city. Uh, you know, there's a general manager in each city, and the general manager hires an operations manager. Uh, his or her job is to actually have enough supply, let's say supply 50 drivers, and then the GM hires a marketing manager whose job is to uh, create uh, demand. So they do marketing, and boom, within a month, there is actually a business going in a new city. It's a repeatable model that we can use uh, when we get approvals. Sometimes the city operation starts in a month, but internet takes six months to come in that market. So how do we 
get offices run. So we use a lot of wireless connectivity uh, and fixed wireless and also um, 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 mobile wireless solutions in these markets to uh, power that office. IoT. So this is a typical self-driving car, and you can see the LiDAR on top. Uh, you also have some video sensors, uh, audio sensors, et cetera, and also a modem with IoT chips. So this self-driving car, because this, by definition, if in, in the future, there won't be anyone in the car driving this. How do you locate the car? You can actually locate these cars only with the IoT chips and modems on these cars. And, uh, uh, these cars you actually won't start uh, without these IoT modems connecting to a wireless network. Uh, of course, when it starts moving, it'll, it'll continue moving until uh, it comes to a stop. So super important to have reliable connectivity and uh, partnerships in around the world where we need to make this self-driving work. What happens when um, uh, 5G comes into being? Uh, with the promised uh, latency of less than 10 milliseconds, uh, and um, um, the, the, we feel that the machine-to-machine -machine connectivity are, is going to increase, which means can the two terabytes of data that I talked about with self-driving, can some of these happen over uh, the wireless rather than having the cars pull into a depot, connect a 100 gig cable into the car like a uh, you know, gas uh, pipe and have the data transmitted via optic fiber back to my data centers. So it gives a promise of the latency and, uh, and, and, um, and uh, bandwidth to actually use some of the data on a wireless basis. Uh, but based on the current economics, it's still less, you know, it's, it's still 1,000 times cheaper to actually transmit data to, uh, through uh, optic fiber. So the cost needs to come down if this 5G utilization needs to uh, prosper for enterprises. If your self-driving car looks like this, uh, would each seat have its own Netflix connection? How is that going to be served into these cars? Is it going to be separate pipes? Is it going to be a single pipe sliced with SDN uh, to these, uh, uh, to these uh, seats? So all of these things are things that we think about. So we're on the 5G committees for a lot of telcos, uh, guiding them to uh, think about use cases and develop uh, some of these standards along with us. So one of the big problems in freight industry is the idle time is a big waste. So depending on the contract that you sign, either the driver is getting paid for just sitting there idle, or a uh, driver is not getting paid. So either way, it's a waste for either the shipper or the trucker. So, and what happens is sometimes these trucks wait uh, uh, in, in a dock for four to five hours without having the right approval, right permission. So we put an IoT solution in, these, in this trailer which actually reduced the cycle time, uh, the, the idle time, uh, from three to four hours to one to two hours. Hence, powering revenue, uh, reducing waste for uh, the business. We also had mapping vehicles that went around 80 countries around the world, mapping roads in a 2D and 3D fashion, and using um, this data sent back to our uh, offshore uh, locations where they used to scrub this data, create maps. Uh, there were 3,000 agents working on just maps that we, our drivers could use. Uh, so we use a hybrid of our own maps uh, you know, and, and, and map uh, provider data from other partners as well. And IoT is uh, how we capture this data and transmit this data back to our partners. We also have uh, dash cam videos on Uber-owned and leased cars that help capture uh, safety incidents that can be for uh, use for uh, law enforcement purposes and also for uh, insurance purposes because now with the data we can actually reduce our own insurance costs. We also have in our own Uber vehicles uh, OBD2 dongles that connect and find out the mileage driving patterns which then can be fed to our insurers to actually reduce our insurance costs. Insurance is one of the biggest costs for Uber because we self-insure our rights. And to the fact that we actually uh, ended up becoming an insurance carrier in America uh, because to, to, in order to reduce our costs. And uh, we are one of the 10 big, biggest auto insurers in America. So this is how a typical Uber uh, restaurant concierge looks like. Uh, you see all these tablets given by different food delivery companies around the world. 
uh, and they, they do that because they don't want to compete with the real estate space off the desktop in, the, um, in these um, uh, restaurants. The problem is that these are all Wi-Fi connected tablets. Now, what happens if Wi-Fi goes down? No Wi-Fi, no business. Uh, and we really need to have these restaurants powered up. So then what we did was, uh, in a lot of non-Western world, Wi-Fi is not as ubiquitous as it is in the Western world, which means uh, there's a huge risk to business. So we connected an embedded tablet with uh, an LTE SIM. And when the data from Wi-Fi went down, LTE picked up. And we worked out some models with companies where we only paid when the tablets were being used hence securing revenue for uh, these markets. We also have drones uh, connected uh, via IoT. We can't locate these drones without IoT uh, uh, network. Uh, super important for us to get the IoT uh, right to actually use these drones, reducing our costs, delivering, improving accuracy to deliver packages. We are planning to launch a million of these bikes in the next uh, year or so around the world. And these bikes can't be located without IoT uh, because these are connected uh, bikes to know the battery charge, to send updates, to know the location. Uh, we, we really need the IoT connectivity. And we, we can't afford to have carriers uh, not have connectivity so that our business model is supported. Same with scooter fleets. So like bikes, scooters are also becoming very popular, IoT connected uh, scooter fleet. Now, uh, also when you design stuff like this, what happens when we launch a million bikes with a particular IoT carrier, and uh, let's say two years down the line, I'm going to negotiate with that uh, carrier, how much leverage do I have? Probably none, uh, because these are all connected uh, you know, uh, SIMs from these carriers. So are we thinking about the right technologies with, for example, like EUICC? Can I over the air change these carriers to uh, enable uh, connective uh, to enable carrier switches. So we need to be designing this right, and we need to have more carriers adopt these technologies to serve needs of uh, global companies. And how are we? I'll give you. I think with uh, the last part, how, how I'll give some examples of how we are turning some of these connectivity into competitive advantage. So. Uh, in, this is seven, eight years ago. We were trying to launch in India, but we could not launch in India because the smartphone penetration was pretty low. Our drivers who come from one of the most uh, disadvantaged classes, they did not have a smartphone, hence could not really use Uber service. And then we basically partnered with the telecom industry in India where we used to buy the phones, uh, let's say at $20, and give the phone to drivers at $25. So I was one of the biggest customer of telcos around the world uh, buying these phones and giving it to our drivers. And that helped open up a market. So partnerships uh, like that help uh, open up new business lines uh, because without mobility, there's no Uber. This is the... Uh, signal strength map uh, published by the carriers in the US to uh, FCC. Now, of course, this is self-reported data. But I think what Uber is, if you think about it, is these 4 million drivers going around the world is actually an IoT network. So I have live signal uh, data and also tower handoff data that I can get, uh, which can be passed on to uh, the industry and regulators and act as a, a, an alternative source for self-reported data on, and on a live basis with a live uh, API. And this is competitive intelligence. So how are we monetizing the data as well? So data is the next oil, which means how are these big uh, OTTs and brands using the data that they have to add value to the market? Uh, we all, so whoever is in the SMS industry knows that the biggest problem in the SMS industry is delivery. And uh, uh, carriers don't tell uh, brands and aggregators whether the SMS has been delivered. It just tells them SMS has been sent, which is not a great useful information that, to have. So now with new technologies, if Uber app is installed on 100 million phones, there are technologies available out there where you can actually know as Uber, of course, the permissions given that an SMS has been delivered on your phone if Uber app is installed on your phone. So how do you partner with, let's say, the SMS industry to give them that data using Uber network? Uh, so thinking outside the box, actually helping connectivity providers uh, optimize their uh, business as well. 
uh, I explained this. So using uh, connectivity actually to power revenues when the Wi-Fi goes down to keep the connectivity up. So with this, I conclude. Uh, when you think about uh, connectivity, uh, when you think about your own businesses, I encourage you to think about uh, things outside the box, uh, which, uh, we, which will enable you to think uh, and get new, into new revenue streams. For example, Uber built this uh, network of 4 million drivers. But we realized that only half of those drivers are fully utilized, which means if they drive for 40 hours a week, most of them are driving less than 20 hours a week. Now, can we utilize the rest 20 hours a week for half of those drivers in a better fashion? Uh, and then now we're creating network of, let's say, handymen, network of uh, consulting professionals, network of uh, babysitters. So maybe a gig worker, a gig economy worker can not just be a driver, they can do all the other things because they have probably more than one skill set. So we are not just in the transportation business, we are actually in the, in the labor business as well. So once you are a network company, once you are a connected company, a lot more possibilities open up. So I encourage you to think about your business not just as a core business, uh, core business line, but if you're, you become connected, how else can you use uh, your revenue models? With that, thank you very much for uh, your time today.